Go ahead. Okay, my name is Ray DeLucci, and before I begin, I want to apologize to all my Ether friends, and because the papers I'll be presenting today and tomorrow are non-Ether type theories uh, well, for the speed of light. But recently, I've been I just went through Steve Ratto's uh, big book, Ether Kinematics, and I'm reading his Ether Dynamics. So I am my mind is open to Ether theories, but I've actually written some papers on that, but they're more recent. This will be in my, my pre-Ether days. So apologize to my Ether friends. <laughs> I'm going to talk about constant versus non-constant speed of light. Simple example, I'm Italian, so let's start with bocce balls. Riding in a car moving at a constant speed V, you hold a bocce ball, which has a hard surface, in each hand. Place the ball from your left hand on the car floor. Reach out from the car and place the ball in your right hand on the icy shoulder of the road. And why I used icy shoulders is frictionless. Relative to you, both balls maintain a stationary position. The ball's in the car, it's going along with you. The ball on the icy road had the same velocity when you released it, so it's sliding along with you. Relative to the roadway or an observer on the roadway, both balls move forward parallel to each other and you. However, if you're in the wonderful Einstein world, if you picked up both balls after 10 seconds on your watch, Einstein would say that you would see that the observer's watch registered less than 10 seconds. And the observer would see you picking up the balls at greater than 10 seconds on his Einstein watch. If all seconds are created equal, then for the observer to explain how you were able to pick up both balls at the same instant and location, you must have traveled faster than V, since only greater than V times 10 seconds can equal V times greater than 10 seconds. But if you had traveled faster than V, you would not have been able to pick up the ball on the roadway after 10 seconds on your watch, for it would have fallen behind unless it too traveled faster than V. But then we're back to both balls traveling at the same speed relative to the roadway, but now both of them are going greater than V. Since you obviously retrieved both balls and the observer saw this, someone's watch is wrong. Let's, let's go with tennis balls now, because I want to bounce things. Now you're holding a pair of tennis balls, one which you simultaneously bounce vertically from your left hand in the car, and one vertically from your right hand on the roadway, catching both at your hand's release point at the same time, and position relative to you. So on the car, boom, on the road, and came back, and as you expect, it did its little uh, diagonal thing. Relative to you, both travel up and down along the same line. There's no horizontal displacement. The observer sees the same relative to you. Relative to the roadway, both follow diagonally symmetric paths, which both you, and you have a glass floor so you can see this stuff. You can see the road moving along. And the observer see equally. Relative to you, the distance traveled is purely vertical and shorter than that relative to the roadway, which has horizontal displacement as well. Your watch registered one second from toss to catch for each ball. The observer's Einstein watch registered something else, less than one second from your perspective, greater than one second from his. Relative to you, as seen by you and the observer, both balls travel the same vertical only distance at the same speed. Relative to the roadway, both balls travel the same diagonal distance, horizontal and vertical, at the same speed, again as seen by you and the observer. Again, we ask the question, how can the times differ? Let's take a special car ride where we're going to be involved with laser pens. Replace the tennis ball with a pair of identical laser pens, both pointing vertically downward. Oops. Wrong. Release a light pulse from each onto the mirrored floor of the car and a very reflective icy roadway. Would not the paths traced by both laser beams be analogous to those by the tennis balls? And would not the same question arise? How could the times differ? If the times are the same, then the explanation is simple. In the car, the laser beam traveled at C, vertically downward, then upward. On the roadway, it traveled at the vector sum of C plus V of the car, which is greater than C, along symmetrical diagonals, no difference in times, only difference in distances due to the difference in speeds. 
generalized to an array of laser pens at an origin zero, zero of a stationary reference frame such that each laser pen points at each integer of 360 degrees in a circle. So I got 360 laser pens basically creating a circle. It's a no-brainer that if the laser array is stationary, 360 pulses emitted simultaneously will travel like an omnidirectional circular light wave. If, it, if I had a spherical thing, I would, in three dimensions, it would be a spherical wave. But let's stick with two for geometric simplicity. In the same way as from any point source. This is a picture of that. The green lines going here and here at C, they represent the vector sums of the blue dashed, which are the lines. There's another one down here. I just didn't show it, so we get too complicated. But the blue dashed light beam from the laser at speed c, and the black lines, the vector sum here, such that the vector sums equal c. So this is c, and that's c. This is an isosceles triangle. And when you use the law of cosines, you'll see that this occurs at the angle here measured from here is 84.26 degrees. Therefore, any light beam issued from a laser pen pointing to the right of the green lines, so any light beam from any of the laser pens in this almost hemisphere, travel at speed C with the maximum would be the speed here at 1.2 C because the laser array is going at 0.2 C to the right. Any light beam issued from a laser pen pointing to the left of these lines so we're talking about this little bigger than hemisphere from the green lines in that direction. We'll travel at speeds less than C, and the minimum would be along here, where it would be 0.8 C, 1 minus 0 0.2. Only the observers at this specific angle and one light second from the reference point 0, 0, see their respective light beams at one second as before, when the array was stationary. An observer at x equals 1, 0 now sees his light beam sooner than before. He sees it at 0.8 seconds. The observer at minus 1.0 and 0 sees, has to wait 1.25 seconds before seeing his light beam. These differences have nothing to do with the variation of time, only variation in light speed due to the moving source array. Note that the light beams themselves are still released relative to their lasers at constant speed c. So how could light, unlike sound or water waves, travel at different speeds in the same medium, for example, a vacuum, if we consider such as a medium, when at least for sound or water waves, the medium itself determines the wave speed regardless of the motion of the source? My speculation is that light is not a wave like sound or water waves, that is one which is actually the movement of the medium itself, longitudinal or transverse. If light has a medium, for example, an ether, although to date it's it's been undetectable, then it is not the movement of the medium itself, but some other phenomenon. Light obviously interacts with different material media. I mean, the example, for example, as it passes through denser media, it slows down. It cannot be the movement of the medium through which it passes that determines the speed. Can it even have a medium in the traditional sense of a medium? This is where I go into, what I like to do is see if I can I look at other people's explanations of a lot of these things, and sometimes I, I actually was able to find two here where I think by combining them I came up with one possible explanation for myself. I, th I think, re oops, Kurt Renshaw is actually going to speak, uh, I think it's tomorrow, but if you're, a lot of, if you're probably fairly familiar with his work, Restoration of Space and Time, that's on, here's the website if you need it and he's developed the radiation continuum model. If you were at last year's conference, you met my friend uh, Dick Calkins, who was in the process of writing this book, Relatively, Relativity Revisited, which he has since published it, and he presented a theory where light is its own medium. And so I'll briefly discuss these two theories and then assimilate them to try and come up with an explanation for the behavior that I'm observing. I like to, I use the, uh, this is my own term, I, call, I called it spring theory, contrasted with string theory. If you're familiar with Kurt Renshaw's approach, he basically treats light like, at least like a spring or an elastic. 
Each, autom each automobile will remain adjacent to a specific mark on a piece of elastic stretching alongside them as long as they maintain a constant velocity. So if this was all coiled up and it was shot out, obviously this end is going to be traveling the fastest. This end doesn't move at all. And then each point along this elastic is traveling at increasing but different constant speeds. His example in his uh, website, uh, this, he's got a car going here at 20 miles per hour, one going at 50. As the piece of elastic is stretched, all points maintain their same velocities and relative separations. The ratios here, one-third, 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 are the same here, one-third, 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 although the elastic is stretched out. In this model, light does not radiate from its source at a constant velocity of c, but in the same manner as a piece of elastic anchored at the source, one end pulled forward at a constant velocity, capital C, which could be potentially much, much greater than c. Component of light traveling at any speed in the range from zero to C with the key characteristics of this model of light and of living in electromechanical observers that only, a, that, the, that only that component of light that strikes the observer at a relative velocity of C in the observer's frame of reference will be detected. So the Renshaw's approach basically says, regardless of our velocity, the only light we can perceive is that which is traveling at 300,000 kilometers per second. That is, if this were the 300, if this was light, and this were the 300,000 kilometer per second point on this light on this uh, elastic beam, we can only see this. We can't see the light traveling at this speed, which is less than that, or that speed, which is greater than that. And that's one explanation for the observation that light always has a constant speed. His radiation continuum model, RCM, allows a more intuitive Galilean structure of space and time where the laws of electromagnetic radiation conform to Galilean transformations, similar to Newton's laws of motion. Concepts of space and time are absolute. He does not specify an upper limit on the speed of, of, of light, the capital C. He developed a model of light as a rubber band anchored at its source and moving forward through space at all speeds from zero to C. The second uh, approach, Calkins and I call it light as its own medium. He examines the nature of light from first principles, starting with the behavior of familiar sound and water waves. He postulates that the electromagnetic field, in quotes, of light itself comprises its propagating medium, analogous to what, is it, what at least is partially occurring with the more familiar tangible media like air or water for what are sound and water wave propagation. To me, this suggested an interest, interesting analogy with McLuhan's observations, namely that the medium is the message. This codependency is characterized by the epsilon zero free space permittivity constant and u zero the free space permeability, and it is not coincidental. Now he had he had a full presentation of this last year. This is very compressed. For the speed of sound, the velocity is equal to the bulk modulus divided by the density, both of air, square root. The bulk modulus describes air's resistance to compression. And then you can write the bulk modulus as the change in pressure, which is needed to reduce the volume, initial volume V0, by a given amount delta V. And so that's, his, that's the formula for the bulk modulus of air. These two characteristics of air determine the speed of sound. Calkins proposes that the same phenomena are at work for the propagation of light as for the propagation of sound. They are the bulk modulus and density of their mediums of propagation. The underlying physical significance of the epsilon zero and mu zero are as follows. Epsilon zero is not only the permittivity of free space, but also the ratio of the electric field's density to its bulk modulus. And he expresses that as epsilon zero equals to rho electric field, B electric field. Analogously for mu zero, it is not only the permeability of free space, but also the ratio of the magnetic field's density to its bulk. He then substitutes these ratios into equations for speed of light, and he ends up, you know, this is the c equals 1 over the square root of the product. He comes up with the square root of the bulk modulus, and he combines electromagnetic and 
in both cases, a bulk modulus for electromagnetic and a bulk density, where EM represents the combined electrical and magnetic, electromagnetic fields, which work in unison as light's propagating medium. You can compare this to the speed of sound, V equals the ratio of bulk modulus to density square root, and they have the same form. The only difference in these two equations is that the electric and magnetic field parameters are separately stated in the equation for the speed of light, whereas their effects are combined in air pressure, in the air pressure, volume, and density parameters for the speed of sound. So after reading through these two theories, and I actually, uh, I was the editor for Dick Kalkin's book, so I had a chance to look through that many times. I now attempt to combine Renshaw's and Kalkin's theories into a reasonable description of the observed constancy of the speed of light from a stationary source in any particular medium, while allowing the speed to vary with, within the same medium with a moving source. I assume Renshaw's spring, spring theory for light is analogous to a cannon in space, frictionless, no gravity. Sealed at one end, open at the other, it has five cannon balls exactly the same size and mass, each with a fixed type and amount of explosive charge between them, including one between the first ball and the sealed end of the cannon, such that when any charge is detonated, it applies the same force F linear, linearly along the cannon tube. So here's my cannon. Here's my five cannonballs, and here's my five uh, charges in red. With all five charges detonated simultaneously, boom, the respective acceleration A imparted on each ball is this formula here, and in units of force per mass, the ratios of accelerations from the ball at the sealed end to the, that at the open end are like one, one, to, one and five, one and two, one and two and five. As the cannon is in space with essentially no gravity, once ejected, the balls will attain constant speeds V determined by the time interval delta T over which the explosive charge is detonated via the equation V equals acceleration times change in time. Since delta T was the same for all five detonations, the ratios of the five balls' velocities will be the same as those for their accelerations. So we've exploded. The balls are shooting out, and I think you can already see kind of how this is analogous to an expanded spring from Renshaw's theory. And the ratios of the four distances delta x between them will also remain the same even as these distances increase over time. So between balls one and three, the ratio is five thirds. Between two and four, the ratio is two. And between three and five, the ratio will be three. And that ratio, although the distances will change, the ratios will remain the same, just like uh, Renshaw's expanding spring. So for this assimilation, for this to be analogous to Renshaw's spring theory, which sees the elastic ever expanding with widening differences between the precession of points at increasing but constant speeds, each cannonball must continue at a differing but constant speed according to these ratios. If we view these cannonballs as points along a light beam, not necessarily getting into whether it's photons or waves, then for the beam to be analogous to Renshaw's elastic and Kalkin's wave, it requires a medium to limit it to a constant speed, actually a range of constant speeds strewn along the beam. Now we take advantage of Kalkin's medium as the message approach, which provides a medium for light other than the traditional ether or the non-existent medium of the vacuum. Kalkin's theories, and again, it's in his book and was from last year's presentation, is that the medium for light is the electromagnetic field itself. As with other media, although not non-material, it still provides a means by which to limit the light wave to a constant speed, namely C when in a vacuum from a stationary source. So in summary, combining the two postulates of Renshaw and Kalkins, one seemingly reasonable model for light is Redshaw's radiation continuum model that allows light to travel over a wide range of speeds, but due to Kalkin's electromagnetic medium, which provides resistance, it's limited to being observed at a constant speed in a particular medium when emitted from a stationary source. My conclusion is that I postulate that light can behave Galileanly by acquiring the velocity vector of a moving source allowing for speeds different from C. Renshaw's spring theory supports this by assuming the source motion moves the observer to a different point on the elastic or light beam 
remember there were two different cars on there, one car traveling at 21 and 50. If you change the speed of the car, you're at a different point, you'll see a different speed of the elastic traveling. While a constant speed is still observed, the true speed could still differ from C. In a material medium, Calkins acknowledges that the medium itself provides resistance to the wave, in addition to that inherently provided by the compression of any electromagnetic field due to the atoms of the medium. A moving source in such a medium has its speed limited by the resistance from that medium itself. Questions that arise from this, light has no material medium, only the electromagnetic field itself, at least from what I've presented here and the assimilation. Therefore, when the source of light moves, the electromagnetic field, which is the medium, moves along with it, since the medium is generated from the source. Could not this allow for Galilean addition of the C and V vectors for a moving source of light? And from Renshaw's uh, radiation continuum, continuum model approach, could not the speed of light different from C correspond to being able to observe the true speed from a different point along the elastic beam? That concludes my talk. <clears throat> Any questions? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Speak up um, loud, please. No, no, no. He, he just speak loudly. Okay. Uh, well, I think I like to say that what you talk of as bulk modulus is the same as pressure. Yeah. Again, that's uh, that's Calkins' theory. So I. Yes. I'd so so we can say that the the speed of sound, in I guess. This is square root of pressure over density. density. Yeah. Now, if you take an electric field as a medium that exerts that exact pressure, also as a medium that has energy and mass, we can also show that the velocity of light along an electric field is equal to the pressure over the density. That's that's Calvin's theory. Yes. I. So you agree? I, I tend to go with that. You agree with Calvin's yes. theory? Yeah. You yes. were you, you were there last year, so you saw his full presentation. Yes. yes. And you mentioned uh, uh, the speed of light being dependent on the speed of the source. Dependent. Yes. In right. other words, well, I say carries, it's released. Light it's all. carries the speed of its source. It acquires the speed of its source. Light itself relative to the source is released at C all yes. the time. But if the source is moving, then it picks up that source yes. velocity. Yes, okay. That's, I, I that's my, <coughs> my posture looks here. Go ahead. So uh, first, maybe I will provide maybe two encouragements. Uh, one thing regarding the covariant uh, variance, actually there is a head uh, formulation of mass equations where he using the total variability on time uh, over time uh, instead of the partial one, it actually provides the Galean uh, invariance for Maxwell uh, equations. And I'll say that Dick's, uh, Dick Calvin's presentation and his theory works from Maxwell's equations. So, uh, on the other hand, uh, 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 <laughs> as I, as I hit, uh, before, actually, we should really look at the, the ether physics, uh, the ether dynamics, and out of that, everything would be matched uh, literally. I would really be really really interested in that book. I would have better yeah, see the, the book of uh, Tsiukovsky from Russia, we'll see later. And then, you know, uh, we have also transversal uh, perturbations, uh, mechanisms, and also longitudinal. So that should be also uh, included. I think uh, Steve included. Rado has yeah. given, I mean, he died a few years ago, but I think he's given a lot of talks in the old NPA on his theory. This, the first book's about 500 pages. It's called Ethro Kinematics. I just came across it recently, and I just finished reading it, and then this is his second book. And I mean, if you're, there's different theories of ether. His is one. I mean, it's a very interesting theory. And I myself I, I believe like that for light to I, I, be, I, yeah. I believe that for light to be constant speed C all the time, regardless of motion of source, there has to be an ether to limit it. So like, like well, I'm saying here, um, my theories here say that if there's no ether, then I don't see a limiting speed for light. In the back. Yeah. 
Have you ever thought about doing, uh, submitting a proposal to do these experiments in space? There's at one time uh, aboard the space laboratory they were accepting experiments. And this would be interesting, the expanding, the spring uh, theory that you have. And if you could take an, uh, an explosive and you have an expanding spear in that the space, be... you have no inhibition to that. Actually, in the talk after this, uh, this is, this is Dick Calkin's book, and I brought it along in case anybody's interested in getting into the details of, I'm just touching on his theories here. He actually has proposed an experiment to compare whether light has a constant speed or whether it acquires the velocity of its source. And I will, my next talk will kind of summarize his experiment along with one, one of my own. And if you're interested in that, you can take a look at this and see it in greater detail. Yes? Yeah, so I wanted to ask, um, the idea of, of light picking up the source is typically called ballistic theory, and there's a number of those. Um, but you said the key here was that he somehow assumed that the observer, whether it's a human or a sensor or something, only saw the part of that, that expansion that was moving at sea. So does he suggest how it... Uh, I believe he'll be here... He's speaking, isn't he? I think tomorrow. Who? Kurt Renshaw. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, you right. can ask. You can ask Kurt I, if he was here. Give him an Actually, I'm glad he's not here today because if I made any mistakes, I, <laughs> yeah. he's not here to see it. But he. I mean, this is a very, very compressed. It's his website. He has a huge explanation of this. I'm not sure. I can't recall because I wrote this about a year ago and I haven't been on his website. I'm not sure if he gave a physiological reason for that. But I know he believes there is one. But when he's here tomorrow, I, I don't know if his talk is going to be on his RCM model, but certainly ask him that question. We're going to have time. For because the point being, I mean, you just said another thing. One is physiology as an observer, but a lot of our sensors aren't physiological. Yeah. Right? So we got to find out how silicon does it, just like yeah. you or, or something. Yeah. We have time for one more question, Zoss. Well. Uh, this is a comment. Uh, the ring laser can accurately detect the rotation of Okay. But it can't detect the, the movement of the Earth around the Sun. So it says that the, if you do an experiment, there is, a, the, you might say, uh, an entrainment of the ether with your experiment. And you, if you can't get out of that ether, you don't see anything else but right. what's in that ether. Well, then that, you're ether back to that ether is the electromagnetic field. Then it would agree with what you have to say, and it means that an experiment has been done that supports what you have to say. Well, so. I think that I think that Dayton Miller, Nicholson Morley showed was not a pure null result. There was some movement there, and I think Dayton Miller confirmed that. He actually showed, a, I think it was a, a daily variation. So I mean, there's there's a whole literature out there that argues for there being some sort of ether-like effect, whether it's uh, ether drag or ether absolute. I mean, like I'm saying, I, I'm open-minded to the idea of an ether. I'm reading ether theories. These presentations here are based on no ether, but objecting to the, I just don't see how the light speed is limited without there being a medium. It, it, it boggles me. Okay.